together and brings us back to each other and all the other stuff sort of fades away. We have a 15 year old son, a 13 year old son and an 11 year old daughter and the 11 year old will tell you the boys hate me and I will go to the boys and say Grace says you hate her and I go yeah. <laughs> but for a moment they are able to step outside of themselves and really give a gift to each other. Um, and, and honestly, sometimes what the boys will say to her is, thank you for not being so annoying today. <laughs> and she owns that. That makes her chest puffs out just a little bit because they have said something uh, that she has valued and that she has connected with them. And other times they, are, they give a much more meaningful uh, like if it was her idea to do something great, they'll give her credit for that idea. Um, or if she loans them a radio or something like that. Um, but they are learning to, to look at each other with these eyes of appreciation. And uh, we know those, that's skills that they need uh, for the future, but we also know as a family um, that that is part of what we uh, can do um, to be the best who we are in the world. And, and so in April at our CEO retreat, and a few of you were there, um, the highest rated speaker, uh, the most uh, really energizing guy who was there was a guy named Chester Elton. Chester has been nicknamed the Apostle of Appreciation. And Chester preaches this um, to businesses. And his, his message is clear, is that um, the more ways you can find to show appreciation for the people in your organization, the better they will perform, and they've got you know they've got research that backs that up. Um, so uh, he demonstrates how constructive praise, meaningful rewards, can powerfully motivate all kinds of different people. Um, he even had a room full of CEOs standing up and screaming just to get a fuzzy carrot thrown at him. So um, if uh, if that appeals to you, uh, he, you, know, you ought to bring him to your business and, or at least read his book. His book is The Carrot Principle, um, he's a fantastic speaker. So uh, there's a whole business around uh, appreciation. Um, so number six, small groups, <laughs> leveraging small groups. Um, my introduction to the power of small groups comes, of course, from the church context. And John Wesley, who is called the father of Methodism, um, didn't set out to start a new denomination. He set out to revive the Church of England. And the primary or principal way that he did that was to organize people into small groups where they could get to know one another and be known and hold each other accountable uh, for what he called the spiritual disciplines. And um, so this accountability and the practice of the spiritual disciplines, he found and he promoted and he promulgated and it became popular to do this in what he called class meetings. The Methodist Church today still uh, values this concept of gathering people into groups of eight or ten, um, maybe as much as a dozen people, um, for the purpose of being accountable and go, growing and being strengthened in what you're doing. And um, of course, I learned that through the church, but Scott had many other right. examples. So, yeah, from, from a young age. So I was a Boy Scouts was my main activity when I was a kid. And um, what I learned later was uh, Baden-Powell, who founded the Boy Scouts based on a military model, which is the smallest, the functioning unit that can actually get stuff done, is a patrol or, or a squad, 10 people. And so the patrol of the Boy Scouts was 10 people. And with 10 people, you can get something done. You can communicate, you can know each other's strengths and weaknesses and balance those out. Um, um, so 10 is the basic unit, and then as, as I got into other organizations, church, rotary club, business, it became clear that uh, anytime you have a board or a committee that's larger than 10, you're in trouble. Anybody had that experience? Um, so, uh, in fact, our Virginia Council CEO's board uh, a couple of years ago went down a path of restructuring our leadership from a 19-member board to a 8-member board. Um, I can't tell you how much more we get done in less time, more effectively, with that kind of leadership structure. Um, so that brings us to what we do at Virginia Council of CEOs, which is roundtables. And a roundtable is eight to ten non-competing CEOs. Um, 
they don't join Virginia Council of CEOs uh, to be part of Virginia Council of CEOs. They join to be part of a roundtable. It's that small group that is their core involvement. Um, it's a safe place. It's a, it's a place to be known. It's a place to grow. Um, it's a consistent group of people who are mutually committed to one another. Um, the main activity in that group is sharing opportunities and challenges with one another. Um, and they respond by sharing their experiences with each other. Um, and because they're sharing their stories, they get to know each other beyond the surface level, um, and they're able to help each other become stronger, better CEOs. So a part of leveraging small groups is fostering commitment. That's John Belushi. <laughs> He's very committed. One of the four values, I just love that picture. I don't know if it has anything to do with commitment. He's committed to his organization. Well, yeah, that was a committed group of guys, as you remember. <laughs> um, one of the four values of Virginia Council of CEOs is commitment. Uh, we ask each CEO before they join us to agree to attend every single roundtable meeting. Um, and then each roundtable has their own rules around commitment. Um, if you're late, there's a fine. If you miss two meetings, we kick you out, those kind of things. Um, so um, that commitment drives uh, what we think is severe performance, which is indicated by um, uh, retention. So you, you look at commitment, people are committed, they attend 94% of the time. We have 94% of our CEOs attend a roundtable every month. Um, and then we retain about 9% a year, which is phenomenal for an association. In the uh, church context, we might call commitment engagement, and, uh, and we're not as sophisticated about measuring engagement, though we do take attendance and you know, we have statistics about worship attendance. Um, but for me, engagement has this sense of being fully present, that your commitment, and the best way I can describe it is as a parent um, and a person who works, I am at my worst if I wish I was at work and I'm with the children. Or if I wish I was with the children and I'm at work, I, I'm just, I'm a house divided and I can't, I'm not fully present for the task at hand. And, um, and so what I have learned is there's, there's power, uh, energy, things get done better and joyfully and propelled forward when you're fully present. And fully present and engaged could be, in the context of church, being at worship. But fully present also means being with another person. Um, I told this story on Sunday worship uh, this past Sunday of this uh, amputee who was trying to get to the summit of Mount Rainier. And um, as an amputee, he only had one leg. And there was this sheet of ice that he and his other fellow climbers had to, to cross in order to make it to the summit. And the other climbers put, on, put spikes on their shoes. And they had spikes and that kept them going forward on this sheet of ice that they had to cross. Uh, he only had one leg and um, two crutches. And what he found he needed to do to get across the ice was to fall flat on his face and scooch his body forward and stand up and fall flat on his face and scooch his body forward. And it took four hours for him to cross the ice in that manner. But his daughter was with him. And she was yelling in his ear, you can do it. You're a great dad. You are the best dad. And that to me is commitment. She got nothing out of that four hours except uh, promoting her father. And, um, but she gave herself in a way um, that something got accomplished um, because of that, what I would call the ministry of presence. She didn't pick him up and carry him. She didn't provide him food. She didn't even pray for him as far as we know. What she did was be present. And that's that uh, engagement uh, principle that really gets things done. My brother and I used to call it moral support if we had to clean our rooms. I didn't need him to help me clean my room, but I wanted him to come sit with me while I cleaned my room. And I would do the same for him. We called it moral support. So I'm, uh, this is number eight, this is the last power tool, and I'm gonna give you the secret sauce to Virginia Council of CEOs, and um, you, can, um, you can use this in lots of different ways, so um, let, me, let me tell you about it. Uh, it, is, it has a fancy name, which you can forget, but it's called the Gestalt Language Protocol. You might write that down. <laughs> uh, but essentially it means share experience, 
not advice. Who loves to get advice from people you run into? Okay. Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, our CEOs meet in monthly roundtable meetings. It's a four-hour meeting. Um, no advice is given. You would think they'd go in there with challenge of the day or opportunity of the week, and they would want to tell me, tell me what you think I ought to do. Well, absolutely forbidden. Um, so there are lots and lots of reasons why this is a more meaningful way for peers to communicate. Uh, but let me just give you a few. Um, first, it, advice is, is risky and unsure, um, as you know. It can be insulting. It can be incorrect. Uh, it can be burdensome. You might feel some obligation to do something about the advice somebody who's important to you gave you. Um, but, and it's often based on nothing but opinion. Um, uh, Bill Isaacs, a professor at MIT, said, I can't possibly insult you by telling you what I did in my own experience. I can't possibly insult you by just telling you what I did. Um, so those are the pitfalls. Um, second, sharing experience is connecting my life to yours in a way that helps us both learn. Uh, i got two examples for you. Um, I was at my roundtable this week. I have a roundtable of uh, association CEOs of smaller associations, so we're peer organizations. Um, and um, one of my peers um, was worried about raising dues. Uh, hadn't raised dues in five years. Uh, was worried about attrition, uh, kickback, things like that. Um, no one told him what to do. No one said, here's what you ought to do, or have you tried this? Instead, what we did was share our experience in raising dues. And everybody had different experiences. Um, my experience was that after a five year uh, of flat dues and jumping up significantly after five years, we had higher attrition. And then the five years since, we've done incremental increases since, and we don't hear a peep from anybody. Um, and I just shared, that's my experience. That's the data, that's what I've done. Others had different experiences. Um, and he walks away with, I think, more information than he had and, and better information than if uh, we told him what he ought to do. Um, and then the other one is a uh, teenage son story. Anybody have or had a teenager? Um, so my son Sam is uh, turned 16 next summer, and he's talking about getting a, a job next summer. Uh, he has friends who work at Chick-fil-A. He wants to buy a car. Um, and he's also a football player, and he's a very committed football player. He wants to play in college, and so he's at the point where he's about to be a sophomore. He's going to spend a lot of time in the spring and summer training uh, in preparation for football season. Uh, and my first thought was, Sam, you don't have time to work a minimum wage job at a restaurant. You know, you'll be at the whim of their schedule. You won't earn much money. And I said, wait, 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 wait. Um, so what I did instead was I shared my experience. I said, uh, hmm, yeah, I had a job like that once. I was, I think I was 16, and it was Burger Chef. Um, it was not a real pleasant job. The first job they gave me was sucking the oil out of the fryer <laughs> through the cleaner. <laughs> I had these brand new shoes with crepe soles that I had just gotten. They, mel piece. they melted on the floor. Um, but, you know, I, got, I earned some money, and, and then I got to uh, Christmas week, and they scheduled me to work till close, which is like 1 a.m. on Christmas Eve. And I decided that was not the job for me. Um, and, and what I did, Sam, after that was I decided, well, I, I, I've done some painting. I could probably paint houses. So um, that summer, I got another guy with me, and we talked to some parents of friends of ours and got painting jobs painting their houses. And we could pretty much work whenever we wanted to. Um, we earned a lot more than minimum wage for the hours we spent. And um, that seemed to work a lot better for me. So he's thinking about what he's going to do. Um, we have two older boys, and then um, our daughter came along. And we spent a lot of time on the ball field and watching the boys be who they were. And I'll never forget the time that I was, um, Sam had a baseball tournament, and Grace was about three. And um, 
she hooked up with a group of other sisters at the ball field, and so four or five of them, three and five year olds, were all playing together. And I watched them, and I just watched them. And, it, and I had an epiphany about the difference in, in the way girls and boys play in this example. And here's what the girls did. They took turns telling each other what to do. And it really didn't even matter if the person did it or not. What each child wanted out of the experience was her turn telling other people what to do. And um, one of them would stand up and go, okay, now we're going to run in circles, and then we're going to go tag the trash can, and then we're going to come back. And then the next girl will get up and go, okay, now we're going to touch our toes and, you know, giggle. And, um, and I told Scott about that. I said, this is fascinating. All they did was take turns telling each other what to do. And Scott said, of course, they're practicing to be wives and mothers. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, my father was a pediatrician. And he gave out a lot of advice. And most of the time, people paid him for that advice. People would come and ask him uh, questions. And they wanted his advice. But he gave me the best advice ever based on his experience. He said, I've learned that nobody wants free advice. So you should just save your breath. And, and that informs me when we talk about, unless your name is Google, stop acting like you know everything, um, share experiences, not advice. And um, we hope that we have done that for you today. We hope that through our stories and our experiences, you're able to take away something that is meaningful to you as you figure out uh, what your source of power is, how you want to use your power, and um, all those things. And we have some questions uh, for you to think about as you leave here. Uh, what is your source of power? How does your use of power define you? How does it help you answer that question? Who am I and what is my purpose? Um, other questions are what are you doing with your power? And um, how do you express your power, maybe a better way to put it. So that has been our goal today, is to share some stories from our lives and to help inform you about what it's like to be the new power company. <laughs> um, and I'll close with uh, the thought that uh, we, you and I, um, are some of the most powerful people on the planet uh, by virtue of education, wealth, uh, opportunity, um, just luck of zip code where we were born. Um, I think it's incumbent on us to be purposeful in the use of that power. Um, whether it's in a business setting, or your church, or your community organization, so. Your family, your personal realm. Yeah, so think about the intersection of purpose and power in your life. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>